Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marty Garrison, and it is my honor to introduce to you our next Eagle. Colonel retired William D. Hawk Mole flew 100 combat missions during the Korean War in an F-80 aircraft, dropping bombs and, and rockets, striking land targets in support of ground troops. After the Korean War, Colonel Mole continued to serve in the Air Force and flew 275 combat missions during the Vietnam War in an F-100, F-5, and O-1 aircraft, flying at supersonic speed, dropping napalm, bombs, and rockets on air-to-ground targets. Colonel Mole's courage and action and valor, uh, valor in action were an inspiration to those who served with him. He retired with honor in July 1977. Without further ado, please get, help give me a warm welcome to our Eagle, Colonel Retired William Mole, being interviewed by Gathering of Eagles team member, Major Bradley Peronsky. What a pleasure it is to be here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored. I've enjoyed being here with the other Eagles, but mostly since I retired in 1977, living in an, a residential neighborhood, getting back on an air base with my kind of people, the Air Force people, was one of the greatest thrills that I've had in this whole week, and I really have enjoyed it. I'll uh, try to give you a few little stories about some of the things that happened on my career. I've enjoyed it, and I sure appreciate the honors that are being bestowed on me. Thank you. Colonel Mole, welcome. Why don't you tell us how you got started in aviation? If, if you bought every book that was written by a pilot, not just fighter pilots, any pilot, you could take the first chapter in that book and, and throw it away because they're all the same. Most of us, and I'm talking about people from my vintage, uh, learn about flying by First of all, reading World War I pulp magazines. You could buy them for a dime. Those were the only flying magazines that were available. And stories about von Richthofen and the Red Baron and Eddie Rickenbacker, these were very exciting things. Uh, we, uh, then we eventually started building model planes, most of us, and then uh, one way or another, finally went out to an airport and uh, uh, decided that that was going to be what we wanted to do. So how'd you get started uh, flying then? You said you got out to an airport. How'd you really get into an airplane? On the 4th of July of 1945, my neighbor uh, friend and I uh, with nothing more better to do, we climbed the water tower next to our house and looked down on the lake. This was in uh, North Muskegon, Michigan. And there was a little seaplane flying down there, a little tailcraft on floats. And I said, Jerry, I just got paid. I worked in the grocery store after school. I want to go for an airplane ride. I've never been up in a plane. So we went down to the seaplane base. and. Uh, I met the, the uh, gentleman that was operating, and I went up and said, what would it take to get an airplane ride? And he said, uh, $5 for uh, 30 minutes. But uh, for an extra $50, or uh, uh, an extra 50 cents, I will give you a flying lesson. And that is how it started. One little uh, uh, ironic thing. The man that ran that little field was an ex-colonel in the Russian Air Force, a man named Peter Ivanov, who was a friend of Shaversky, Sikorsky, and some of the great Russian pilots. He had an accent. <laughs> it, it, it's, 
a little irony involved in the fact that a Russian taught me how to fly. So, uh, so you got up in the airplane, and there, there came a time when you were working at that airport, correct? Well, what happened, uh, I was ready to solo that, uh, that little seaplane. I'd flown through the summer, and uh, of course, uh, you know, I'd maybe fly once every week or so, it was expensive. Uh, I went down to fly at, in the early fall. There was a note on the door. From, uh, the, Ivanov had said, uh, gone to Florida for the winter, see you next spring. So this was just prior to my solo. I had not solo. I was ready to solo. So I went out to the local airport and I met the people there. And uh, they also had a tailor craft, a little 65 horse bird, and uh, started flying that. And eventually, that's how I solo. How'd you go from there? to moving into your Air Force career? I saw an advertising, the Air Force was big on that, says, uh, join the aviation cadets. Only the best can be an aviation cadet. Wow, this is fantastic. What happened after World War II, most of the pilots went home. All of a sudden, the Korean War reared up and the Air Force needed pilots. So they opened up the aviation cadet program. I couldn't wait to sign. You had to pass a uh, uh, two tests, uh, uh, a mental test and a kind of an aviation test. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, get a physical and all that sort of thing. Uh, I went ahead and uh, lucked out, took the tests, and passed. And they said, well, you're." I was 19, he said, we're not going to take you yet. Uh, it'll be another year. Well, six months later, I got called to report for primary training, and that's how I got started. How did uh, how'd your primary training go for you? Well, it was exciting. Uh, uh, one thing I didn't mention, and it, it, it caught up with me a little later, while I was uh, worked at that little airport, I, I got a job as an airport kid. I actually accumulated in two years before I joined the airport, a thousand hours of flying time in just about every light airplane you can think of. Especially, I love to fly the old antique biplanes and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's, that's how, uh, what was my question, Brad? <laughs> We, so we were talking about your, your basic training and your experience, whether you had okay, any hang-ups. Okay, uh, uh, The biggest airplane I'd flown up to then was uh, a uh, BT-13, which was a pre almost as big as a T-6. I couldn't wait to get in that airplane. So we went through uh, basic uh, military training and started to fly. Uh, the instructor uh, had four students for instructor. And I had a real senior captain who had a lot of experience with a wonderful instructor pilot. And he got us together and he said, do any of you have any previous flying experience? Well, the upperclassmen had got a hold of us earlier and said, don't, they're gonna ask you that. If you have experience, don't tell them because it'll go hard on you. I don't think they want, they don't want you to come in here with bad habits. So when my turn, I said, I had a couple hours in a cub. Okay. So we go up on the first flight, and he gets, hands me the T-6, and he said, you know how to do a turn? I said, let me try it. I do a couple steep turns. He said, you ever do a wing over? I said, yeah, I can try one. A couple wing overs. He said, uh, you ever do a slow roll? I said, well, I can try one. I did about two or three rolls. We land. He said, tell me again about a couple hours in a pipe of cup. <laughs> and that's how that went. And I, and I, I had a wonderful time in, in, in training in the T-6. I had some bumps in the road. When my instructor went on leave, they assigned a newly qualified lieutenant instructor pilot. And I went up one day with him, and he was going to teach me how to make wheel landings. 
I had been making wheel landings in the T-6 right along, but I didn't say anything to him. So, you know, fine, sir. So he gets, he gets the T-6 down and about five feet in the air, he pushes forward and he starts bouncing. And this thing starts yo-yoing and about the third bounce, I grabbed the controls, took it away from him and landed the airplane. We taxied in. Can you imagine the kind of words that this guy had for me? But what he did was report me to the stage commander. Walter C. Turnier, the toughest captain that was ever invented in the world, stood me out of brace. He said, what gave you the authority to take away an, air, an airplane from an instructor pilot? Students don't do that sort of thing. I said, well, sir, he said, why, what? what? I said, he was trying to crash us. <laughs> he said, is that so? Well, you're, you're too smart for your instructor. I'm going to find out. We're going on a check ride right now. So we suit up and we climb in a T-60 and he takes me up in this thing. And he said, he said, all right, let me see what you can do. Well, I figured that was a washout ride. I, and I had nothing to lose. So I turned that airplane every way. <laughs> I turned that thing every way but loose. I did every stunt in the world. I, and at the top of a, a loop or a Cubanate or something, he pulled the throttle and he said, okay, simulator force landing. He did that three times with me. And the last time was on the go-around after a simulated landing, and he caught it again. And I, I hit every, I, we didn't touch down, but, but I set up to where I could have landed on any field. So we went back to the op shack. And he said, okay, mister. So you're a pretty hot pilot, <laughs> but not very smart. So here's what we're gonna do for the rest of the week what you're going to do is come down and don't worry about the flying schedule. You're not going to be on it. But you pick up your backpack parachute and I want you to start marching around the stage house and let that thing bang your legs. And while that's happening, think about taking away air airplanes from instructor pilots or anything else you can think of. So that's kind of how basic went. I, uh, <laughs> I survived uh, towards the end. Uh, the big challenge was, OK, uh, you're going up to advanced training. You have your choice uh, of assignments, uh, fighters, bombers, what have you. And uh, uh, I said, well, hey, I fighters, you know. Well, you had to be recommended. And even though I had problems uh, with discipline, what have you, I got fighters. And it was great. Do you want to tell them a little bit about getting into jets, or should we move to Korea? I went to Willie Field, uh, Williams Field, Arizona, and uh, we, they had the F-80s. And of course, that was our first line jet. I was so proud. But the 80s, they had, they had the old A and B models. And boy, they were clunkers. Uh, the A models even had wooden floors. I mean, it was kind of a cross between a wooden airplane and a jet. <coughs> I got a couple rides in a T-33, and uh, uh, the instructor said, you're ready to solo. So I climb in an OA model, and I taxi out to the end of the runway, and I slam the canopy shut, and the thing comes off the track and turns sideways. <laughs> I'm in the takeoff position, ready to fly this, this 80, and I'm holding on the canopy. <laughs> the mobile control officer happened to be there at the end of the runway called me on the radio and said, uh, don't do anything, just stay there a minute. He came out, climbed on the wing, took the canopy, reseated it, got it back in his track, pushed it closed. He said, now, lock it slowly, don't bang it. I got it closed. He climbed off the wing and said, go. And I got my first ride solo in that airplane. <laughs> Interesting times, huh? <laughs> Let's move into Korea. Tell us about your first assignment there. OK. Um, well, th to start shortly real quick, uh, I had a choice of 
three ba different bases or three choices for assignment. And the Korean War was started, and I couldn't wait to get into a war. I, you know, I wanted to be the world's greatest fighter pilot, so I said, Korea, Korea, and Korea. He said, we're not taking new graduates. You don't have enough experience. But he was wrong. They were so short of pilots that in two weeks, I got orders to go to Korea. So I joined the uh, Eighth Wing, and they assigned me to the 36 Squadron, 36 Squadron. It was very interesting because they had just converted from the Mustang to the F-80, and that squadron, the pilots had anywhere from five to 10 hours in the F-80. I had over 200 hours, and I was, a, as a second lieutenant, the most qualified F-80 pilot in the outfit. And uh, well, that, that didn't hurt me a bit, and they did ask me to uh, get checked out as a test pilot, uh, routine maintenance test, aileron change, that sort of thing. And I said, of course, I'd be glad to do that. So you mentioned the F-80. Tell us a little bit about, about the missions in the F-80, and you wrote about it in, in your book, not the GOE book. But. Well, our missions were, were typical, uh, close air support, interdiction, uh, uh, bridges, tunnels, uh, close air support uh, with the Army. Uh, that was kind of touch and go because we didn't have a real good forward air controller set up at that time. And that led me into my next job because after being uh, in the squadron, I had about 40 missions. All of a sudden, it was my turn to be a forward air controller and to go up with an Army regiment for two weeks to guide in fighter strikes because we they had no trained forward air controllers. Well, okay, so I went to Iwakuni, uh, got a bag full of uh, military gear, uh, pistols, you name it. I said, where do I sign? He said, you don't have to sign anything. We're never going to see you again. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <clears throat> I go to Korea. I jump on a goody bird, and I go to Seoul, uh, land in the riverbed, go up into the city, I'm to report to the 65th Regiment. How do I get there? How do you find a regiment? I'm in the middle of town with a big bag of stuff. I don't know where to go. Here's, I walk by, and there's a mass shooter. So I go in and see the doc and say, hey, any way you can get me, you know where the 65th is? Yeah, uh, it's, it's up by the, by the river. Well, can you get me up there? Sure. So that's how I got. That's how I found my regiment. And <laughs> so I walked in and reported to the Army. And they assigned me a great big squad tent that was full of a, a bunch of other liaison officers. So I, I put, set up my cot, put the bag down, and went around to meet my fellow Army friends. They didn't have time to talk to some lieutenant Air Force guy who seemed a little bit noisy at the time. So I said, OK, they don't want to play. I went back to my cot, opened up my bag. Fortunately, I was smart enough to put a couple of bottles of old tennis shoe whiskey, that stuff that they used to issue us after you know, so many missions. And I popped the cork on that, poured myself a cup, and all of a sudden, I was surrounded by, <laughs> by new friends. And that's kind of how I got into the unit and get started pretty good. Do you want to tell us, or can you share about the bombing runs on the bridge? The bridges at St. Andrew were integral crossing the big river up there. And so on this day, our mission was the, a wing mission, 80, uh, uh, 50 to 55 airplanes by squadron, take off at noon, and we're going to go up and try to knock that bridge out. Perfect sunny day, lovely. We took off from uh, Gimpo. We went out to sea. We flew up the river estuary. I was number four in the last flight. Our squadron was the last squadron. And I, we were carrying the heaviest load that F-80 would, would load. We could only get to about 22,000 feet with all that load. I looked ahead, and I watched those other flights go in, and they, enemy had some 88 
flat cannons left over from War II, the, the greatest anti-aircraft gun there was. The sky was full of puffs, all kinds of puffs. You've seen those World War II pictures, I know you have. I looked into that flak and I said, wait a minute, I got to go into that thing. So I started looking at the dashboard in my plane to see if I could find something wrong. All gauge, maybe malfunction, anything, so I could abort. Everything worked. There it was. So I went in, I dropped my bombs. I don't know if I hit the bridge or not. I think we only hit that bridge with two bombs of all of those airplanes, 50 some airplanes, and we only knocked out a, co a portion of the span. Uh, Recky said the next morning when we went back, we found out they had already rebuilt it. Today, of course, we all know that one bomb would have taken that bridge out nothing. But that's the kind of war that I fought in Korea, and that's what we did. It was not real scientific, it was kind of left over from what we'd learned in war two. You tried some different things to make it more scientific, too, to make your bombing runs more Well, accurate. because we, 80 was not a good dive bomber. We took grease pencils and we put lines on the canopy to, so that when you rolled in on a dive bomb run, you tried to, to get the best angle and maybe put that bomb where it belonged. And uh, we also would put a protractor along the canopy rail. Any idea that would work. Nothing worked very well, but we tried. Talking about trying different things, you, you were a test pilot for a while. Um, you had a scare one time as a test pilot. Tell us well, about that. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make this short. Uh, a real smart captain taught me, he said, Bill, when you, when you test fly these airplanes, he said, if anything's going to happen to them, it's going to happen uh, right after takeoff. So take off and circle the field, get some altitude before you go out to the test area and be ready. I got to about uh, 10,000 feet on a test stop one day and bang, the engine, loud noise. Cockpit filled with smoke and I thought, uh-oh, here, here we go. Uh, I knew that uh, something bad had happened. I'd lost power and it was still running, barely. I said, that's it. I'm going to learn how to be a parachutist. So I pulled the levers on the ejection seat. The, the old lady had a, a, a cable that went to the cannon shell. Somehow the cable was not hooked up. The seat would not fire. So I said, well, I'll open the canopy and step lightly over the side. <laughs> the canopy was jammed. So the cockpit's full of smoke. I'm right over the airfield, and I got to land this plane. I called the tower, and I said, tower, I've got an engine problem. I'm going to try to get this thing on the ground, and I'm stuck in the plane. If I get it down, ask the, the response crew there to get that canopy off so I can get out. I had to go to 100% oxygen to hold it under my eyes so I could see the land, but I got it down. I probably touched down at 200. I blew both tires. I probably had the brakes on before I did anything. Anyway, I got it stopped on the runway. Uh, the, the crash crew got that canopy off momentarily. I was wearing a parachute backpack and a dinghy. I jumped out on the wing, ran off, sprained both ankles, and ran about 50 yards on my knees. <laughs> a fireman tackled me. He said, it's OK, Lieutenant. We got the fire out. You're safe now. <laughs> I wore the, the, the knees right off the cloth right off that flying suit. So I took it to the supply course the next day and I drew a new flying suit. Well, uh, the, the squadron guys got my old suit and they hung it up in the op shack <laughs> with a note that says, Bill Moe breaks a hundred yard dash, blah, blah, blah. I said, <laughs> laugh, you guys, but I'm here to talk about it. So those are the kind of things that we went through, Fred. So you fly over a hundred missions in Korea Tell us about your transition home. Well, you want to talk a little bit about this forward air control problem? Let's hear those. Uh, so when you got into the forward air controlling, uh, how did that work? And tell us about the operation itself. Well, uh, we, I started talking about that. And mm -hmm. 
they pulled us, pulled me out of the squadron to go up there in two weeks. How far did I get in that story? My mind's wandering a little bit. You haven't talked about tanks yet. Okay, the Army guy said, hey, the only way, we want you to go on this patrol, uh, but you have to go in the tank, and we're going to teach you how to load the cannon because you have to take the cannon loader's position. These were old Sherman tanks. I said, okay. So I meet the tank commander, another lieutenant, and we get up in this tank, and they're, they're briefing me. The shells on a tank are stuck in little compartments all over the floor of this thing. So we, uh, we, we're on a reconnaissance patrol with five tanks. And we get into enemy country, and all of a sudden, uh, we started picking up some small arms fire. And so we were in the, I was in the lead tank, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, the tank commander falls down and, and grabs his arm. I said, what happened? He said, I just took a hit. He said, I think I'm going to faint. I said, well, then you're going to die because I, there's nothing I can do, but there's a medic back here. Get on the radio and call the medic. He said, OK. So he didn't faint. He called the medic, and we got him out of that tank. I got in the next tank. That thing got kind of bloody, and uh, I moved to the next tank. We, we tried to get up on the main service road. We threw a tread. When you throw a thread on a tank, it's like a farm tractor. You got to get out with a crowbar and what have you and put the thing back together. Well, all of a sudden, uh, we, we pick up a lot of small arm fire, and all of a sudden, we're, we're getting attacked. The tank I was in had a big master sergeant who was a World War II guy. He had to be 60 years old. I'll never forget him, Sergeant Goodwine, big black sergeant, wonderful, strong man. I asked him, what are you doing here? Why are you here in this war? He said, well, I had nothing better to do, and so they called me up. And, uh, he started shooting that machine gun and started shooting these Chinese shirts, started coming for our tank, and the gun jammed. I happened to be packing a couple of 45. Don't ask me why. I, th I guess I thought I was John Wayne or something. <laughs> uh, I also had pockets full of bullets and a couple of clips. Anyway, these Chinamen started climbing up on our tank. So I'm sitting there with these 45 shooting them off. <laughs> and, uh, and, and meanwhile, our sergeant finally got the damn machine gun running. Well, that ended that. And, we, and so we broke it up. But, we weren't about to get out and get shot. We had to leave that tank. So we, we evacuated. He said, drive everything you can. I ended up uh, grabbing my radio, and uh, I pulled the 30 cal machine gun out <clears> and threw it over my arm. We walked up to the next tank. We had to leave that tank in the mud. And we bailed up. That was the end of the day. So that's uh, uh, real quickly, we had to go back. We got back the next day and got that tank back. And I'm already running awfully windy, so I'm going to quit, Brad. We're, what we're, else you got there? We're doing good on time. Um, so tell us about the transition out of theater, out of Korea. Oh, just a little tidbit. Uh, I've, been, I've not been home for a year, and uh, uh, so I rotated. I got to Chicago, and I was living in Michigan, and my family was there, and they knew I was coming. I got on a DC-3 Goody Bird. Uh, to cross over Lake Michigan and get over to uh, uh, Grand Rapids, where my family was. And uh, I sat next to a little old lady in tennis shoes. And I guess I was sitting there in that chair and gripping the armrest. And she finally looked at me and said, a young man, uh, don't be afraid. I fly in these planes all the time. I couldn't have the courage to tell her I just finished 100 plus missions in Korea. <laughs> That relaxed me, and I got home safe. Where'd you go after that? What was your mission after Korea, your first assignment after Korea? Uh, what are our notes say, Brad? I'm trying to remember. We can work that in. So uh, the, the F-84G. Uh, I went to Turner Field, uh, Albany, Georgia, and we started flying the F-80 straight-wing F-84 
G, and uh, that was a great assignment. Uh, it was a lot better airplane than the F-80, a little faster, uh, and it was good to be back in the States. And uh, I, had, I had a good job there in the 31st wing. And the privilege of working for Colonel David Schilling, who was a big War II ace. And in fact, uh, I was lucky in my, in my early career days to meet or work with or for some of the great aces of World War II. It was, it was really wonderful days. Tell us, uh, you have a refueling story that goes, goes well, without a sign. Well, uh, refueling was still new, and the F-84G had a, had a little door on the left wing. Uh, they said, what, what is that? Well, that's the refueling air. What? Refueling midair? Wow. One day in squadron operations, the ops officer came in and he said, uh, Bill, there's going to be a B-29 tanker up around the base. Why don't you guys go up and see if you can hook up to them? Well, we had read the procedure on how to fly under the tanker and it had lights on the bottom to guide you in. So, okay, so uh, me and the Lieutenant Lloyd C. Smith, I'll never forget him, we went up and we found the tanker and I went in and I got a couple dry hookups. The uh, boomer was very, very professional talked us fighter pilots in, got us in position, I got a couple dry hookups, just practice. It was Smitty's turn. Smitty was a little spastic that day, or maybe the air was really rougher, I don't know. He got hooked up, he started sashaying around, all of a sudden he had brakes off, and when he broke off, about two feet of the nozzle of the boomer's hose was stuck in his wing. There was a long moment of silence, Smitty said, uh, tanker pilot, uh, this is fighter pilot, uh, what would you like me to do with this thing? <laughs> Please send it home. And of course, that cost Smitty a lot of beers. Tell us about Fox Peter One. One of the greatest adventures, the first crossing, jet crossing in the Pacific, our F-84G, uh, led by Colonel David C. Schilling, and uh, uh, we took three squadrons across from uh, uh, San Francisco to Hawaii, and we island hopped midway Guam, and we talked uh, Wake Island, uh, and on in Tokyo, it was exciting. Uh, we had crews sent out ahead so that we could refuel. I got to see all those islands uh, that I'd read about, you know, in and, and the big war. Uh, but we, uh, uh, in between uh, San Francisco and Hawaii, uh, the vice wing commander is a, a colonel named Diggy Dunham. Diggy Dunham was famous, well known by an awful lot of people and a tremendous guy. Diggy was not real proficient, but he was flying a, a fighter. All of a sudden he got on the radio and he said, hey, boss, I just flamed out, I just flamed out. Uh, he had been jockeying the throttle trying to refuel, I guess it was at the refueling. So uh, I think it was Colonel Schilling said, uh, well, Diggy, uh, we just passed a uh, destroyer on the, uh, in the ocean down there. Go down and belly in alongside them and they'll save you. And he said, his wingman's named Bob Allen. He said, Bob, go with them and take care of them. Bob Allen says, what, what? You want me to bail out and go with him? His airplane was running perfectly. <laughs> All of a sudden, he says, hey, boss, I got it started. It's running hot, but it's running. The boss says, don't touch the throttle. You take the lead, head for Hawaii. We'll fall in behind. Long story short, he got it home. He got it made. We all got there. Uh, happenings along the way. Those were the days. So you move into the F-84F, and that was your sound barrier experience. The first for... swept wing airplane and the first airplane to go through the speed of sound. Of course, you had to dive it. It would not, not go through level. Like most pilots, I always wanted to see what it felt like to go through the speed of sound. So 
As soon as I got checked out in the F model of the F-84, I couldn't wait to go to 30,000 feet, point that thing down and say, I'm going to break the sound barrier. Of course, Chuck Yeager and a whole bunch of other people had already broken it, but I never had. Well, I was very disappointed because we punched through the mock, and the only thing that said you're going past the speed of sound was the clock on the dashboard. So, you know, no big deal. But anyway, another little happening along the way. Now, the F-84 uh, had engine problems, and we crashed three airplanes in the first three months we had it. And we lost two of the pilots, one of them escaped. So the wing commander said, Gordon M. Graham said, uh, Call the Senate, he said, I don't want any more heroics. The th thing quits, punch out. I'm on a test top. I'm at 30,000 feet or 25 or so, and my engine quits. I said, hmm. So I head back towards the base, and I, I get the checklist out, and I read the checklist, and I go through the air start procedure two or three times. Nothing happens. I'm on the radio and mobile control. We always had a mobile control at the end of the runway. I called and I said, Mobile, break out your emergency procedures and slowly read me the air start procedures. I went through it again. No start. I kept my airspeed up. The engine was windmilling, but it wasn't running, but it was running the pumps that kept the hydraulics and everything working. So I headed back from the field, got high over the field, kept my speed up, come around to land that plane, and uh, I got on the final. I was still high enough. I could have punched out, but everything worked. I put the gear down, and lo and behold, it came down and locked. I made a beautiful landing, taxied to the end of the runway and turned off. And about the time I was climbing out of the cockpit, the wing commander came running up in his staff car. Bill, what's going on? I said, sir, I flamed out. Well, he, it, your landing looked very normal. I said, well, it worked out pretty good, sir. Well, he said, you must have had some engine power. I said, put your hand on the aft section of that airplane. It was ice cold stone. I'd been sailing around at altitude, and of course, the engine was dead. He said, I want to see you in the office in the morning. Yes, sir. Of course, he had already told us a week or so before to punch out if you had that kind of problem. I didn't know if he was court marked for me or kissed me for saving the airplane or what. He didn't either. I'm happy to report. <laughs> but he did make me the, his safety officer, and that's what happened. Before we move into Vietnam, tell us about going to Clovis. To where? Clovis. Cannon. Was it Cannon? Yeah. Tell us about Cannon, sir. I had just finished a tour as a maintenance officer. And I had worked out a deal with one of the senior officers who was going to take command of a 105 wing. And he saw me before I rotated home. Uh, he said, uh, how'd you like to be my chief of maintenance? And I said, fine. Uh, but if you're serious, I'll go to maintenance school. And I, I got myself scheduled to Chinook Field to go to maintenance school. He said, now, when you get ready to graduate, call me, and I'll set you up and bring you down here. I called him. He was gone. He got promoted and sent to the Pentagon. I was a graduate of a maintenance school. They sent me to a, a B-52 bomb wing, a fighter pilot in a bomb wing. you got to be kidding me. Well. Um, I'm going to make this short because we're running. Fighter pilots are windy. You probably figured that out. Uh, I did fly the, a couple missions in the B-52 when they needed a third pilot. Uh, one of these hardhead chrome dome missions over the North Pole, sit there for eight hours over the North Pole, pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> but anyway. I get my next assignment. It's the B-58 bombers as a maintenance officer. I write a scathing letter to military personnel at the Air Force saying, look, guys, 
I need to get back in fighters. I'm a fighter pilot. I just spent three years in a bomber outfit. Come on, I'll go remote. I don't care where you send me. I'm ready to go. I got to get back to fighters. I have the feeling there is some big machine in the Pentagon that dictates officer assignments. I send off the letter. Two weeks later, this thing comes floating in. My wife, I get back from work. She hands me the letter. You're going to open it? I said, pour us a drink first. <laughs> I opened that letter, and it said, pursuant to your request, your assignment's been changed. You're going to Clovis, New Mexico, F-100s. P.S. There is no machine in the Pentagon that dictates <laughs> officer assignments. That's how I got to Clovis. So tell us then, moving into the uh, forward air control position as a first calf. OK. I put in for a tour of 105s. I wanted to fly that thud real bad. Uh, I was doing well, Clovis flying the Hun. Uh, we went into an RTU program where we, uh, uh, the pipeline had just got started. They needed new blood over there in Vietnam. The war was picking up. Uh, they, they turned our wing uh, at Clovis into a replacement training unit. Uh, I had to, the pilots that were still there, we all had to learn to land the airplane, the F-100 from the back seat so we could instruct. Uh, they were bringing in guys that were flying desks or bombers or what have you because they needed pilots pretty bad. Uh, anyway, we, we got that going, and I waited for maybe an assignment to fly the thud. My next orders, Vietnam flying the Cessna 01, which, of course, is the L L-19 for the Army, forward air control. Wait a minute, I already did this in Korea. I got to do this again? I guess because of my record in that war, early war. So, OK. So I went over there, and I went up, and I, I was assigned to the first air cab at Anke in the, in the 01. Uh, I had many exciting times. Uh, I don't have time to recant them all, but I did fly another 100 missions in that little airplane. I worked a lot of fighter strikes. And one of the biggest problems of flying those light airplanes and in and out of little dirt strips is staying clean. I was working the beach along uh, the east side of, of Quignon, and I hadn't had a bath in I don't know when. Beautiful, wide, beautiful beach. I didn't see any activity of any kind. I said, I got to have a bath. So I, I land this little plane on the hard pan, and I get out, and flying suit and all, man, I'm in the surf. I scrubbed myself with sand, took that flying suit off, wrung it out, got back in the plane in my shorts, and I'm glad it started, by the way. And, and that's. You know, these are the kind of things you had to run into. Staying clean was one of the biggest challenges in that war. Uh, it was bad news. One of your commands uh, was at Benoit. You had a fighter command. After uh, six months as a uh, forward air controller, I got a call from a friend of mine at Benoit and said, Bill, uh, there's a F-100 squadron opening up. Would you like it? Would I like to get back in fighters? You got to be kidding me. But he said, you got to get released. You got to go to Saigon and ask the general if he'll let you go because you're, you know, you're a forward air controller. So I go up to headquarters and I knew the general and I won't get into names, but I said, sir, I've got a chance to pick up a fighter squadron. Will you release me? He said, Bill, I was going to call you. He said, you know, I've got trouble down in four car, and you've got a heck of a good record as a, a fact. I want you to go down there and see if you can straighten it out. I said, sir, I've been in the jungle for six months. I got dysentery. I'm, I'm in terrible shape. I got to get out of there. Uh, I need a fighter squadron. <laughs> he said, well, let's have dinner tonight. We'll have a drink. 
I went to BX, I drank a quart of milk because I knew I was going to uh, battle him with martinis, and we did. I put him down, and the last thing he did before we, he and, and his aide and I put him to bed was, you win. <laughs> I go to Benoit, Dick Catledge, one of the great leaders, wonderful man, uh, flew the first Thunder Jets, uh, terrific guy. I was supposed to take an F-100 squadron. I started, I got recurrent in the airplane, and I flew a few missions. All of a sudden, the, uh, they had an F-5 squadron over there that they send over for test. Um, and the squadron commander uh, had been reassigned, so Dick Cotton said, Bill, how would you like to uh, take command of the, of the F-5 squadron? I said, sure, I'd love it. I'll take any squadron you got. He said, you got it. I went down and reported, ops officer, a good friend of mine, Bill Rippey. I said, Bill, the first thing I want to do is, even before I meet everybody, I want you to uh, roll out the two-seater. I want a quick checkout so I can start flying combat. He said, we, we don't got no two-seaters. He said, here's the dash one, read the book. I'll give you a CNI captain to chase you, and we'll give you a checkout. So I learned how to start the airplane, read the book, went up, flew two missions to practice, uh, learned to land it. It was a little difficult to land, and started flying combat. I ended up flying another 100 missions in that airplane. It was a great little airplane, but it had short legs, and the Air Force didn't buy it. Not because it wasn't a capable uh, delivery airplane. We, we actually flew that thing with four or 500 pound bombs, and that was a very small airplane. Uh, it was very capable, but it had no range. So they never did buy it. We ended up uh, giving them to the, uh, I think the Philippines or one of the other companies. I turned over the uh, airplanes to them. I went back and flew a few more F-100 missions and that ended my tour in Vietnam. So before we move in and take a couple questions, you did have one run in with your commander there after a, you were on strip alert in the F-100. Don Hooten, an Aggie, and a sister squadron commander, he was an F-100 squadron commander. Uh, after I turned over uh, my F-5s, and I, I, he said, Bill, how would you like to fly strip alert with me this Sunday? He said, I'll tell you what. We'll go have a drink uh, Saturday night, and then we'll bounce a couple of captains off the flying schedule, and you and I will go sit alert, and we'll get a couple of missions. OK. The way we sat alert was we'd cock the airplanes, put all our gear in it. Uh, everything was plugged in. Uh, the, the goal was to jump in, get it started, taxi out, and get in the air within five minutes. Pretty good challenge. So early morning, we got it all cocked. Or, or first cup of coffee, buzzer goes off. Off we go. Long story short, we flew three sorties that day, and every one of them was exciting. First one was a truck convoy. We knocked the heck out of that. And uh, the FAC who worked us said, you guys were great. I'm going to send a message back to headquarters. No, don't send anything. <laughs> OK, we, then there was uh, uh, some sampans out there full of ammunition. We got some good explosions. The fact says, you guys are fantastic. I'm going to send a report. Don't send anything. <laughs> Putin and I were supposed to have Sundays off. The policy was squadron commanders had Sundays off. Here we are flying. We're knocking the heck out of the enemy. We're doing real great work, and they're going to report us. Monday morning, we get home, Don and I. We go in for breakfast, and there's Wing Commander sitting there. He said, good morning, gentlemen. Would you come over here, please? Yes, sir. He said, what do you think about my Sunday off policy? Sir, it's great. That's a wonderful thing. You know, everybody should have. He, he set us up, and he set that hook, and he said, 
you're both grounded. <laughs> and I'll let you know when you can fly again. He said, you don't know how to follow orders, and you're supposed to be commanders. Well, those things happen, you know. <laughs> can we take some questions? Sure. Anybody? Probably don't know what to ask, Brad. Uh, you know, all that stuff I've been pouring out here. Do you have more fighter stories you want to tell? We've got about five minutes. No, I'll just say a few more things. One of my favorite senior officers reminded me recently that the mission of the Air Force is to fly and fight, don't forget it. And I'm glad he reminded me. And I'd like to pass that on to you. One other thing that, one of my favorite mottos that a lot of us have had for the years is a very simple thing. A pilot, especially a fighter pilot, needs three things. Airspeed, altitude, and a sense of humor. And I offer this to you because I know that you're going through school and you're going to be graduating into new jobs soon. Uh, you need a sense of humor. Don't lose that because it's important. You got any questions, Brad? I think we're good. Do you want to talk about communication a little? Well, if we got a few minutes, communications, uh, I actually had, had planned to talk about it because it's the key to the world. The Mayaguez incident, uh, a shipload of BX supplies was captured by the bad guys um, early one night. I got a call the next morning from uh, my general and said, Bill, we're going to need some fighters. I, I had already heard on the radio they'd captured the ship before the general called. I'd called down the maintenance shack, and I told the maintenance shack, I said, bomb up a dozen airplanes, mixed load, anything you can put on them. I called the ops officer, I said, get a pilot's down here in the briefing right room pretty soon, because I know we're going to go off on some kind of a rescue mission or recap mission uh, on the Mayaguez ship. Sure enough, uh, we launched. Uh, one of my squadrons, I had four, five squadrons, F-4s, and one was a recce squadron. They, they got airborne right away. They found that <clears throat> they, they saw and they circled and they saw where they uh, had taken the crew off the ship and headed for the mainland of uh, the south of the country. Okay. But it looked like the word got out that they, that they were taking the crew to Koh Tang Island. The Marines launched a bunch of helicopters to Koh Tang Island to rescue the crew, which was already on its way to another place. They lost three helicopters and five people. I got word from the recce guys that, uh, at, back at Udarn that uh, the crew had been uh, sent to the mainland, and they're not at Koteng. I called everybody I could possibly on, on the phone and what have you. Uh, in, in fact, I, I went to Hawaii and everything else to try to get word to the Marines to, to hold off. To, don't send any more. The, the crew is not there. There's nobody to rescue. But I failed. Communications. One other thing on communications, real quickly, when I was with the Inspector General, we inspected the Worldwide Airborne Command Post system. We found out that while they had good communications in the local area, they didn't talk to each other. We wrote this up. It was a finding. Communications, whether you're in the classroom or whether you're in combat or whatever, is the key. And I encourage you all to pay a special, special attention to that aspect of your next job. And before I quit, I'd like to congratulate you all for the fine job. I want to thank everybody for the treatment that we've had, us eagles, 
had a ball. It was wonderful. It was pretty intense, but we had a good time. Congratulations to you all, and it's been a privilege and an honor to be here with you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, sir.